Good morning. My name is Bob Singleton, the Greater Story Historical Society, and this is a lecture on the gantries of Long Island City, Friends of Gantry Park, June 2nd, 2021. Right, before we get started in this lecture, just an advisory. Some of these images are actually owned and copyrighted by others, and we're given permission to use them. Uh, so please do not use any of the images for any other publicity or any other programs unless you have expressed uh, permission from us. History of the car flow transfer bridge of Long Island City. This is actually a, a diagram uh, showing uh, what uh, some historians believe was the original configuration of the car flow bridges. First of all, I'll give a brief tutorial of uh, railroad gantries and bridges. There are a number of websites um, that uh, outline the uh, legacy of the history of uh, the railroads in the New York City area. Trainsarefun.com uh, is one of a favorite. It's just crammed full of really wonderful uh, information. And if anybody's interested in pursuing any research, uh, that's a really great place to start from. This is what a car float barge and tugboat would look like if you uh, were in New York Harbor um, in Long Island City in the 1950s, 1940s, 1960s. You can see the uh, barge with the rail cars on top of it and uh, uh, the tugboat is uh, ferrying the uh, barge, probably in this case from New Jersey to Long Island City. You can still see some of these um, that are still in operation in Brooklyn uh, near Bush Terminal. Let's go into a definition of what, what the various elements are. Uh, the gantry crane, lift bridge, terms explained. Basically, a gantry crane is a, um, a device where there's a beam across held in place by uh, two supports, um, and there's a mechanism to lift items um, within this beam. Now, in this situation, the item being lifted is the bridge deck. The bridge deck is sort of a, um, literally as, as the name would, would uh, imply, something that would connect the barge, the rail uh, on the barge with the rails at the terminal. And we'll see some in operation here. Uh, the lift bridges uh, got its start uh, from earliest railroads. Uh, when they were sending the railroads around the country, they would, um, often build the bridges later because it took a lot of time and effort to build, to connect things. So they would have a, uh, a terminal like this, uh, basically a wooden structure. You can see the boxcars there. And they would load them onto a barge and cross the river and then load them on the other side. Um, this actually, this photograph was taken from the time of the Civil War when the front was very fluid and they had to uh, move uh, troops and munitions from one location to another. So there was a lot of temporary lift bridges were built um, this was when the whole system of lift bridges was really perfected about that period of time. The lift bridges in Long Island City date from a few decades after the Civil War. Now, to remove rail cars from a barge uh, was a bit of a tricky maneuver. Um, so you would have a locomotive, which is very, very heavy. You could not put a locomotive onto a barge. So what they'd have is called a reacher car uh, which is basically a light, light flat car that would extend the locomotive's reach. So uh, on, the, on the left, you see actually a car that was used for this. On the right is the locomotive. And in the background are cars that are being removed uh, from the barge. A very interesting process, uh, nine steps. So first of all, um, you had to be real careful when you unloaded cars off a barge that you didn't tip the barge over. These cars were often loaded with really heavy um, content such as coal or, or you know, machinery, what have you. So you gotta be very, very careful not to tip the barge over. So it was kind of a dance between the locomotive and the cars and the barge. The first one you'd see the locomotive backing up. Now the barge would um, have three lines of cars, um, left, center, and right. So in this situation, we're looking at the car, the barge. So they'd remove the left cars, but they wouldn't move them completely because they'd they would destabilize the barge. So they moved it about half the cars off and then would stop and uncouple. And then in three, the uh, locomotive would go back and they make a run for the cars uh, at four on right-hand side. Now those 
cars would be totally removed off the barge, as you could see on step five. Then in step six, they would back the cars up. And in seven, they would remove the cars on the left side. So you only had the cars into center and eight, then move the uh, uh, cars back, a couple of the cars on eight, and then as you can see on nine, they were finished, the barge was emptied. New York City, uh, very interesting why we had lift bridges in, 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 uh, in Long Island City because of the topography of New York. New York was a really fabulous place from water, fabulous. There's no other city in the world that had the kind of advantages uh, of, a, of a harbor like New York. Um, but unfortunately, the topography also made it very, very difficult to bring railroads into New York. Um, is, is, is it to the point where the railroads on Long Island were actually isolated from the national rail network until the Hellgate Bridge was built in 1917. And I'll explain why here. Here is New York City. Here you can see the fabulous rivers that feed all into New York City. This is the, the Hudson. This was a connection through the Hudson to the Erie Canal to the Mississippi River Basin. Um, this was so, the, 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 the Erie Canal was so efficient that we were actually able to take sugarcane that was harvested in the South. And instead of having it refined in New Orleans, they actually transported it all the way to New York City where it was refined and shipped around the world. What happened in World War II was that the uh, government decided the rails were not being usually, uh, was not being efficiently used. And they put a stop to that and they started building sugar refineries in the South. And eventually other industry followed and New York City lost its industrial edge by having um, both the uh, um, network of, of, of uh, industry spread across the country um, and the railroads lost their position with the interstate highways. And we'll show some of that a little bit later here. But here you can see the, the Hudson River. Here is the East River, which led to, of course, uh, Long Island Sound and New England. And of course, here is the great mouth of the harbor, uh, which uh, led to Europe and, and points south. Um, this is Long Island City. And this, the East River was initially the industrial heartland of, uh, of, New, of New York. And the problem was to get to the East River, the only way to actually reach it because of all the various islands and mountains and what have you, uh, was by water. Um, and I'll show you the next picture, one of the problems with getting railroads into Queens. And that was the topography. Here you have the Palisades, which are very hard igneous volcanic rock. And again, this is a, a picture of the, basically it was a wall cutting off New York City from the rest of the country. So the way around that was to bring the railroads into, um, there, there were a few lines in Manhattan. This is Grand Central, which is basically a passenger line. And the New York Central had a line that came down um, along the side of Manhattan. Um, but again, the, the quarters are very, very cramped. You really didn't have opportunities for um, much industrial activity here. And uh, it was just not a very efficient system. So the best system for the New York Harbor was actually to have the trains go into New Jersey. Now, the problem is this was the transportation network this was Long Island City, here's the Long Island Railroad. So what they would have to do was to unload the freight on to, uh, through lift bridges onto uh, the barges, bring everything around to Long Island City and then unload them here. Long Island City's growth uh, is, is uh, fascinating. As late as 1850, it was basically pasture marshland. Here you can see the, uh, the marsh, this is Dutch Kills, here's Newtown Creek. And there was just a handful of uh, country roads here and farms, some of them dating back to the earliest settlement in the 1600s. And it's amazing in a space of 50 years, how this rural landscape was transferred to something like this, which is pretty much close to um, what we have today. Of course, today this is all settled, but as late as 1900, or as early as 1900, you had a, a, a very, very good rail network here. This was the uh, the uh, railroad. This is the Long Island Railroad. This is uh, in the process of being connected to Penn Station under the East River. Now, this is basically a um, 
um, a transportation network for, for people, not for freight or goods. The, this was the uh, terminal uh, for, the, for the freight. These were the gantries. And this was the line along 48th Avenue connecting to what later would be Sunnyside Yard. So this was the, the terminal for the freight um, in Long Island City. So there were two lines, one for passengers and here this was for the, uh, for the freight. Now, the problem with the East River as a location for railroad um, was that you really could not get to it by bridge. Uh, initially, you had the Brooklyn Navy Yard, which required bridges at a certain height, um, which was kind of limiting uh, in terms of the, um, the opportunities to build bridges across the East River. And you know the problem is that the bridge had to be so high that the entrance ramps of these bridges would you know extend well into Manhattan or well into into uh, uh, into Queens. Um, so it was just it was just not practical. And it took the Pennsylvania Railroad uh, in uh, 1900, 1910. It opened 1917 to build the Hellgate Bridge. And really, this was the connection uh, between all the railroads on Long Island. Uh, with mainland, uh, the continental United States. Really interesting, built by the Pennsylvania Railroad. At that time, the Pennsylvania Railroad was the only entity that could build something like this. It actually had a greater revenue base than the federal government. It employed something like a quarter of a million employees. It was a huge corporation, sort of like the Amazon of its time. And they had the resources to build this bridge. Now, how did you transport the boxcars across the harbor? Um, there's an early diagram on the left where they had actually something resembled ferry boats. You know, it's like the Staten Island Ferry where you'd get on the boat one end and get off the boat at the other. And these ones actually transported, as you can see, railroad cars. Interesting picture, that man in the bottom is actually working on the Queensboro Bridge, uh, building the bridge. So he's walking the beam, holding on to a, uh, a rope, as you can see there. It must have been uh, terrific winds up from that height, uh, especially during the winter. On the right hand side is the modern um, way of transporting uh, boxcars uh, with, uh, with the tugboat. And here you can see actually two sets of floats uh, are being pushed by, by one tug, much more efficient than the, the older method. Long Island City was created um, by its location uh, on the East River and uh, sort of basically an entryway uh, to all of Long Island. Now, this is the modern route that was put in for the, for the railroad. Um, here you can see uh, the, there, there is no longer a float uh, here in Long Island City. Here are the, uh, the terminals that are in New Jersey. And to this day, you still have the uh, New York uh, car float route, which is connecting from the Greenville Yard in uh, New Jersey to uh, Bush Terminal, South Brooklyn. And now the cars, the uh, rail cars are transported along the New York Railroad, uh, connecting railroad to Fresh Prawn Junction where they are uh, sent to um, Long Island City or they continue their route up through Oak Point Yard across the, uh, the Hellgate Bridge. And this gives you some idea of the kind of terminal that is now uh, the in in New Jersey, this is a modern map, and as you can see, this is uh, this is Brooklyn. So it's much more efficient for them just to go across to uh, to Brooklyn rather than try to negotiate the route all the way up through uh, through Long Island City. The uh, service in in Long Island City was terminated in the uh, the late '60s, early '70s. This is a picture of the Sunnyside Yards um, in the heyday of the yards in the 1950s. And as you can see again, here are the two lines. This is the passenger line that comes in from Penn Station, goes through Sunnyside Yard and then to points uh, east. And this is the, uh, the terminal uh, for the, uh, the barges. And this is the line along 48th Avenue. This is the heyday of the float bridges, the Sunnyside Rail Yard in 1950s. You would uh, stand at the edge of the yard and look across and you would just see a yard just full of uh, railroad cars, passenger cars. And it's amazing that in the space of uh, within a generation um, that all of this was gone. 
So we're going to talk about uh, what Gantry Park looked like just before the park was put in. Um, I actually took these uh, these pictures um, late 80s or so, uh, 90s, um, and this was just absolute ruin. Uh, you could not even uh, set foot on, on the gantries. Uh, everything had caved in. Um, I was speaking once with um, Gianni Atioli of uh, Mundicus Rustica, who grew up uh, in Hunter's Point, and she had said that as a, as a young kid, it was a rite of passage for uh, the youth in the community uh, to climb the gantries, cross over to the other side and climb down. It must have been a pretty scary thing as a young kid to do, especially as your uh, quote unquote friends were taunting you doing something like this. Um, this is uh, an interesting, this is the, the, the rail yard that leads from um, the, the gantries along 48th Avenue. Um, it's really interesting, uh, to, to the left of this was a, was a row of houses and um, a friend of mine who passed away, uh, many of you might have known him, uh, Frank Corrado, the mayor of Long Island City, uh, grew up in a neighborhood, it was a tough neighborhood and people were poor. And he said the cars would be sitting in this yard and it'd be houses right next to it. And, and his friends would actually put in a slide and it'd climb on top of the cars with the coal and throw coal down the slide and they would have heaps of coal in the backyard, three, four feet. And they would put it in sacks and then sell it for pennies to actually uh, get food for their families during a depression. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of stories, a lot of legends and lore about the rail yard. I won't share with you on, on this lecture, um, but it, it played a very important role uh, within the community, hearts and minds of the people within the community, as you can imagine. And this is what the uh, community park looks like today. Uh, absolutely amazing when you, uh, for those of us who remembered what it looked like when it was a rail yard and when it was just basically abandoned grass, and then when you see what's been done today, it's just absolutely fabulous uh, in terms of how the community is, is reinventing itself. But you know, again, it, there, 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 there's mixed emotions here. Uh, and I think that the people that lived in the community um, feelings have to be respected as much as the people that are moving into the community. And this is a really interesting place where you, you could see this was a, a bridge that was across Vernon uh, Avenue that connected the uh, gantries to the rest of the Sunnyside Yards. And it was something that was kind of dear and precious to the people it was next to St. Mary's Church. Um, and when word was that the bridge was being removed, the people wanted to save it. Uh, and on the right there, you can see the bridge being uh, demolished. So for uh, a few years, there was something called the Hunters Point uh, Community Coalition. And they actually used the girders of the bridge as their logo, which was in the center. And fortunately, as time went on, uh, people began to have a dialogue with each other and the community started to coalesce and uh, the old timers accepted the changes and welcomed the new people. And in the bottom, you can see now uh, what the area looked like where the bridge was removed and you have a fabulous playground and uh, it's, it's a really now a really fine center place for the community. Uh, this is Gantry Park today. That little red circle there are the gantries. Before I go, I want to also invite you to the uh, Lehigh Barge 79 Waterfront Museum. Uh, it's on Pier 44. There were several means of conveyances uh, for the old uh, Erie Canal, the, the barges. You had rail cars. They also had um, these barges, which they would fill up with various uh, commodities. Um, the Lehigh Bar 79, I think, is the only one that is still in uh, restored condition. Um, there's a friend uh, that uh, Mr. Sharp has uh, uh, a uh, uh, his family lives in this uh, in this uh, this place. So they live downstairs, but upstairs is both a museum and um, um, event space, and they have a lot of programs going there. It's just a fabulous time to just come out sometime and visit them. Uh, they're in, near Red Hook, near the IKEA warehouse, to give you an idea where it's at. And you just look out. I mean, I spent a couple of afternoons just chatting with them, you know, about the waterfront and exchanging stories. And you just look out the, the doors there uh, and you see the Statue of Liberty on, on a beautiful sunny day in a harbor. It's just a wonderful experience. So uh, I'd encourage you to uh, come out and uh, see the Waterfront Museum at Pier 44 in Brooklyn. And uh, that uh, concludes our, our story. Uh, we have a book, The East River by Arcadia Press. It's the only book ever written 
by the way, on the East River, as far as I know. We have a series of lectures um, with uh, the Municipal Arts Society. We actually have split the lectures upper and lower East River. Be happy to give you folks a lecture. I'm also uh, giving another lecture with the Municipal Arts Society, a more extended uh, discussion on the gantries, uh, which we're planning for some time later this summer. So again, my name is Bob Singleton, Executive Director, Greater Story Historical Society. That's our website, www.astorialic.org. And as you can see, our logo is the coat of arms of Long Island City. Thank you very much. Look forward to seeing you all at some point in the near future.